Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everyone. Isn't it lovely when, at a moment like this, you get a direct encouragement? Firstly, the scripture that Joe brought, well, I got that down as something I was going to quote from anyway, um, the beginning of John's Gospel. Thank you, Joe, for that confirmation. And then Elena just now was praying about how we should live our lives. And that is largely what Paul is writing about. I'm going to ask Mary to uh, read the passage to us. Although we're, we're only concentrating on just three verses this morning, I'm going to ask Mary to read from the beginning of chapter three, just to remind us to keep it in context. So she's going to read um, from the Good News version. Mm -hmm. so, Colossians chapter 3. You have been raised to life with Christ, so set your hearts on the things that are in heaven, where Christ sits on his throne at the right hand side of God. Keep your minds fixed on things there, not on things here on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your real life is Christ, and when he appears, then you too will appear with him and share his glory. You must put to death, then, the earthly desires at work in you, such as sexual immorality, indecency, lust, evil passions, and greed, for greed is a form of idolatry. Because of such things, God's anger will come upon those who do not obey him. At one time, you yourselves used to live according to such desires, when your life was dominated by them. But now you must get rid of all these things, anger, passion, and hateful feelings. No insults or obscene talk must ever come from your lips. Do not lie to one another. For you have taken off the old self with its habits and you have put on the new self. This is the new being which God, its creator, is constantly renewing in his own image in order to bring you to a full knowledge of himself. As a result, there is no longer any distinction between Gentiles and Jews, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarians, savages, slaves, and free men. But Christ is all. Christ is in all. You are the people of God. He loved you and chose you for his own. So then, you must clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Be tolerant with one another and forgive one another whenever any of you has a complaint against someone else. You must forgive one another, just as the Lord has forgiven you. And to all these qualities add love, which binds all things together in perfect unity. The peace that Christ gives is to guide you in the decisions you make, for it is to this peace that God has called you, together in the one body, and be thankful. Christ's message in all its richness must live in your hearts. Teach and instruct each other with all wisdom. Sing psalms, hymns, and sacred songs. Sing to God with thanksgiving in your hearts. Everything you do or say, should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus, as you give thanks through him to God the Father. Thank you. Amen. <clears throat> Just ask that... Um, Father God adds his blessing to the word and uh, that it's his words that come from here, not, not mine. My um, NIV study Bible has the overall theme for Colossians as being Christ's preeminence. 
Well, if that's a bit of a sort of odd word, it's a bit of sometimes seen as being a bit of Christianese. For those who don't understand it, eminence being stood apart, um, superior, Christ, it's about his, his first, his top authority, his overall superiority. It is his total number oneness, Jesus. Paul explains a bit about the preeminence in, in chapter one and verses 15 to 18. But the letter, again, in my study Bible is divided into six broad subheadings. Firstly, an introduction. Secondly, a prayer for the Colossians or the people in the church at Colossae. And by extension, that's a prayer for all readers. So that's us they're praying for. Paul is praying for us. Read it again for yourselves um, later. Part three is about the nature of Christ. Again, his pre preeminence has already been mentioned. The fourth part, Paul's concern for the church as it was subjected to some false teaching. The fifth part, he talks about the new life in Christ, our new life, the characteristics of the abundant life of the Christian. And that's us too. If we've given our lives to Christ, if we are calling ourselves Christians, he's writing to us, both how we are living and what we should be aspiring to, how we should be living. And finally, there's a conclusion to the letter. So last week, um, we were reminded that we are a chosen, holy, and loved people. And having been told what lifestyles we are to put off in the previous uh, passage, the week before that, we were then told about the elements that we must put on, culminating in forgiveness, overarched by love. This whole lifestyle thing, uh, just drawn to compare it to uh, what Paul said to the Romans, which the mark has fallen out of my Bible in, never mind. You'll be familiar with, with the passage, it's the beginning of Romans 12, where Paul, Paul writes, I urge you, brethren, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing and perfect will. Now, today's three verses, which are just verses uh, 15 to 18 in, in Colossians 3, they come smack in the middle of this fifth section. And it could be seen as being a central summary as to how we should live, uh, live out our Christian lives. Again, we can use some subheadings here. This time I've just got four single words. Peace, thanksgiving, instruction and worship. Um, you know me, I like things that help me remember things. Uh, I really wanted to get a, an acronym from P, T, I and W, but I was really struggling with it. Uh, the best I could come up with was to mix them around a bit. Think about birds, lapwings in particular, otherwise known as peewits. Okay, so you've got P, W, I and T. We're going to stick to the order I first said. So think peewits and you'll get peace, thanksgiving, instruction and worship. So first of all, peace. The NIV version, the beginning of that uh, verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. Well, what is this peace? John 14, um, Jesus speaking, I know I put a marker in that one, there. Uh, John 14 and verse 27, Jesus is saying it, it's part of his um, later discourses, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And I think particularly in these times we're living in at the moment, that is so important that Christ 
has left us his peace. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So we're to let this peace rule in our hearts. But what does that mean? Does it, um, is it no ifs, no buts, no disagreements? There's been a lot of discussion recently of stuff that's come from uh, the government. So what, these, what are these things they're putting out uh, to us? What are the rules that we've got to be obeyed? And what are just guidelines to be followed? And even here, some translations uh, of the Bible uh, sort of speak of the peace being an umpire or an arbiter in our lives. Again, the good news version, for, sorry, Ross. No, I know, I didn't say I did. It's fine. Um, this, this version, as Mary read, the peace that Christ gives us is to guide us in the decisions we make. For it's to this peace that God has called you together in one body. So they're guiding rules. Let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, this peace that he gives us. So I'll then look about what, what's our, in our lives. What's the strongest, most compelling force in our lives, in your life, in my life today? Is it the rule of the peace of Christ? Is our attitude, well, what Jesus says goes, end of story. Or do we have times of, well, yes, but, is there just something else we need to consider? And why must we let the peace of, cruel, of Christ rule in our hearts? Well, the next part of the verse says, since as members of one body, we were called to peace. Or as the good news put it, I'll put it down again. Um, called to be peace for it is this to this peace that God has called us together in the one body and be thankful well whilst uh, this peace is a, is a gift from of grace from Jesus it's also grown from what we read last week about bearing with one another forgiving one another Whatever the provocation, the grievance, the hurt that's being caused, we must forgive. Turn over page. This is low technology and I can still get it wrong. It's only a page. Forgiveness is not forgiveness unless it's unconditional. We're told in um, Psalm 103, aren't we? As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. And what did Jesus say when he was on the cross? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When we have issues with trying to bear with one another, do we forgive like that? Completely unconditionally? the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. Secondly, we come to Thanksgiving. Again, at the end of that first verse, um, God has called us together in one body and be thankful. Despite this clearly being of great importance and it, in, it appears in each of this morning's three verses, and there you could go into things about things that are repeated three times in scripture are really very, very important. And uh, the thanksgiving, thanks, thankfulness appears around 140 times throughout the Bible, according to with a concordance. I'm not going to spend very much time on it because it should be pretty self-explanatory. I wonder whether it is. After all, what are some of the earliest words our children are taught? I think of several of you with 
with the little ones there. I'm guessing that a lot of the words you teach them are words of manners. They're please and thank you. One of the really important things in life, even if it's outside of the Christian experience of life, is to live with an attitude of gratitude. I wonder, what's our default mode of conversation, whether it's with our neighbour, our family or whoever? Do we first start off, have a good moan about the state of the world, the government, rising prices, queues in the shops, the weather, other people's appalling driving, their dreadful manners, their unbearable attitudes? Or is it to express our attitude of gratitude and positivity for all we have? I'll leave it at that for Thanksgiving. Thirdly, we come to instruction. The NIV says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. <clears throat> Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Well, the start of John's gospel, as Joe read earlier, in the beginning was the word. What are we to do with the word? Well, whether we refer it to it as Christ, the word, or to the written word, we have to allow it to dwell in us. Excuse me. <clears throat> to dwell in us richly, that is to let this word live in us, reside in us, remain in us, establish itself in us immovably. As one friend used to say, we need to know it in our Noah, that not Noah as in the ark, our Noah starting with a K. Now, I'm sorry, medical people, and uh, that's not an anatomical or physiological or, or even a psychological term, but it, it implies letting the knowledge settle deeper into it than deeper into us, deeper than our heads, our brains, our minds, um, as deep as it can go. So we know the word, we know what God is doing, living in us. And why? So that we can teach and admonish one another. That word admonish might bother some people. Yeah, it can be translated as correct one another. Well, <clears throat> we'll touch on that in a minute, but teaching one another in and with wisdom and insight in spiritual things, matters pertaining to, to the faith, to our faith. Yeah. We need a lot of care here. There are so many different translations and paraphrases of what is a lightly called our handbook or our instruction manual, the Bible. It's so much more than that, I know. And then within those, there are so many more commentaries and interpretations of what the written word says to us. A few of us can claim to be scholars of the original, whatever they were, languages. And if we were, they're known to have subtle shades of often different meanings. And for generations and generations, much of the word was handed down uh, by word of mouth. So we need to be constantly prayerful for true insight before we launch into any definitive instruction, especially if it involves what we see as necessary correction. It's very easy to correct someone to put our own point of view and to get our own agenda across. However, we are called to instruct one another. As Paul also writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, um, 
he writes to Timothy, be prepared with the word in season and out of season. You know, it's not just the pastors, the preachers, the teachers job, although of course some do have particular giftings in these areas, but it's all of our job to get the word when it's dwelling in us, to share it, to help instruct one another. And so we come to worship, a fourth letter, the W. Now I know that word is not actually mentioned in the text, it wasn't mentioned in any of the translations I've looked at, <coughs> Um, but worship involves our whole selves, our whole lives being lived in a state of adoration, of reverence and love for our amazing God, that God who's Father, His Son Jesus, who's Holy Spirit. But we're told to instruct each other as we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude, there we go again, or thanksgiving to God. That sounds pretty much like our accepted understanding and practice of sung worship to me. We may ask, what are these apparently different categories, i.e. the psalms, the hymns and the spiritual songs? Well, the first thing to grasp is that they all overlap. My understanding of it, and this is sort of partly based on what I've been told before and, and partly what's come to me, it's broadly this. <coughs> yeah, sorry. Oh, my throat. <coughs> um, uh, broadly, the Psalms are seen as being devotional songs or prayers directed from us to God directly. Hymns are songs of praise and worship and adoration. They're often sung altogether. Sometimes it's, it's seen as being sung from man to man about God or from person to person about God. And they may be testimonial in their nature as well. Think of hymns like, um, and can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood. And then we come on to spiritual songs. That can be a, a harder one. And uh, I searched and searched through different commentaries and translations and they all said, you know, almost glossed over the term and most of the translations use exactly those words, spiritual songs. There were a couple that didn't, which I'll mention in a moment. The first time I, time I heard this passage expounded was in a, a charismatic setting where it was quite simply, well, spiritual songs, that's singing in the spirit, i.e. singing in tongues. Well, I'm not entirely happy with that as a definition, although I quite happily acknowledge it has its place. You know, I would do so myself. Um, but I think it's better from these couple of translations I mentioned, they refer to the songs of the Spirit or from the Spirit. Now, it can be either from, directly from the Holy Spirit or from our own spirit or from our heart. They're the songs which come from deep within us, even if they've been written by someone else. And by the way, don't worry if, um, like me, if you don't have a voice of Catherine Jenkins or Alan Jones, um, I, I stick with what the Psalms tell me and make a joyful noise to the Lord. That suits me. When we're singing, I quite often say this from the front, um, be careful to read the words you're going to be singing. Ideally, if you can see them in advance before you just spout them out. You need to believe the words you're singing. You risk perjuring yourself otherwise. I came across several quotations while I was preparing this. Um, I didn't write down who they were all from. But the first one said this. There is, according to Paul, a definite relationship between our knowledge of the Bible and our expression of worship in song. One way we teach and encourage ourselves and others is through the singing of the word of God. But if we don't know the Bible and understand it, we cannot honestly sing it from our hearts. That was the first one. 
The second one included this phrase. If we sing from our lips, but not from our hearts, we're not really worshipping God. I put a little rider to that because sometimes if we make an effort to sing, whether we're together or whether we're alone, when we're feeling spiritually down, empty or depressed, and I know very well that a lot of us in this group have been feeling that way off and on, particularly over these last few weeks, um, then it can be a starting point if we sing together or put on make a point of putting on worship CDs, worship music, that can be a starting point to lifting us up. Remember, it doesn't matter if we're down. God understands. He knows how we're feeling. He knows how we're feeling better than we do. The third quote was this, as a believer grows in their knowledge of the word, they will want to grow in their expression of, phrase, of praise. And that brings us into the context of this piece again. The context of singing in the same sentence as instruction. Singing can be a great way to memorize scriptures. Those of you, um, I, I, didn't, I wasn't brought up through Sunday school, uh, but many of you were, and many of our children have been, and there are plenty of good songs which memorize verses of scripture, and it's great like that. Either the actual words of scripture or the principles of scripture. And these songs also encourage our gratitude. And finally, I'm not going to going to expand on the on the third verse verse 17 it simply says this whatever you do whether in word or deed do it all in the name of the lord jesus giving thanks to god the father through him i said i wouldn't expand i will one one thing whatever you do that's in the present tense whatever you are doing now whatever you're doing whether you're listening whether you're praising, whether you're praying, whether you're dealing with the children, whether you're dealing with work, whatever you're doing, do it in the name of Jesus. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. So, next time you're out in the countryside and you see those amazing birds called lapwings, think peewits, think of praise, and worship, and instruction, and thanksgiving. Amen.